Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M, 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator for startups in the world. We run it out of Silicon Valley, but with a global footprint. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables on a weekly basis. We've done a lot of these, 294th roundtable today, so you can imagine this has been going on for quite a while, and uh, over 40,000 people have participated in this from pretty much every corner of the world. We've had people not only from the U.S., we've had a very big um, uptick in uh, India. We've also had Latin America, Africa, Europe, um, Australia, everywhere, literally. And it's been a real great pleasure and honor to, to be with you in your entrepreneurial journey and learn what you are doing, what you're innovating on, and, and what you're experimenting with. And it has hugely enhanced our knowledge, and hopefully we've been able to add some value to your journey along the way. Uh, the event is being recorded. It will be available um, after the show at our blog as well as on our YouTube channel. If you are live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Our two Twitter handles, at 1M by 1M and my personal one, at Romana, both of those uh, publish very, very intense amount and quality of startup-related content, which you will learn a lot from. So if learning is your objective, definitely follow us in social media. And the YouTube channel has recordings of all prior sessions. So again, another major repository of learning material that you will get a lot out of, 1M1M one one Roundtables is the YouTube channel. Um, these are the call-in instructions. We're not ready for call-in yet, but this is a roundtable, so we will open the line up for call-ins and discussions uh, with everybody in the audience. So uh, just keep these instructions on file. I will put the slide up when we're ready for call-ins. We're going to start our program today with a special guest, Venkat Vishwanathan, founder and chairman of Latent View Analytics. Venkat, welcome. Thank you, Shramana. Uh, let me introduce you a little bit. I um, met Venkat a few years ago when I did the Leighton View Analytics story. It's a really interesting company out of India, actually, um, that has made a big mark in an emerging trend um, in the analytics space. So, uh, you know, for those of you who follow the analytics space, this would be very interesting, or are trying to do stuff in the analytics space, it's going to be very interesting. And for those of you who are building companies out of India, it's also going to be very interesting. We know that there's a big percentage of those kinds of members around the community. So Venkat, tell us a bit about uh, what have been the, you know, evolving analytics landscape and set the backdrop against which you have built Latent View, and then tell us what you do, how you do what you do, and how does that align with these trends? Sure, yeah, Th thanks so much for the opportunity. Delighted to be here, and uh, I must uh, compliment you for all the energy you bring to the startup landscape and uh, how you have enabled so many young entrepreneurs and uh, early stage businesses to have a platform to engage and kind of learn and. Uh, help you achieve the goal uh, that you have set in terms of uh, helping 1 million businesses reach 1 million in annual revenue. Uh, so we are delighted to have that opportunity as well. So about it, so Leading View is just under 10 years old. So we complete 10 years in April. Uh, so 10 years back when we started looking at this landscape, uh, it was primarily a bet on how businesses, especially large enterprises, have spent significant amounts of money in building out their data infrastructure. I'm talking about if you take the mid-90s or uh, even during the dot-com era, companies were spending significant amounts of technology dollars around data warehouses and ERPs and various kinds of uh, uh, information infrastructure. But there was always a question about business payback 
and business impact, and mm -hmm. which is where uh, some of us started thinking, and we picked analytics as an area where we felt uh, uh, if we can help companies derive more value from the investment that they have made, and uh, if there is a way for us to help them combine uh, combine, I would say, business data and math in the most optimal manner for them to get to the insight, uh, maybe there is a business opportunity that we could actually build out. Uh, and that is just the premise with which we started out. And as the uh, uh, landscape evolved, I think every 18 to 24 months, there were new innovation waves that we had to kind of uh, engage with the market, learn from it, and then create capabilities and go after. Uh, an example of this would be how enterprises started adopting social media in a big way, maybe around 2008 or 9. I think Facebook was probably uh, a few years earlier. And as it started gaining customers and going mainstream, a lot of brands understood that they need to be present on this medium and also need to understand how to listen into customers and how to kind of find insights from what they are saying and then channel it back into their business. Uh, another wave that we saw maybe a few uh, uh, or 18 months, 24 months later, would probably be around data visualization. And I always uh, keep referring to data visualization as uh, how email was to the internet, a very simple, uh, easy to use application which helped people get familiar with the new medium. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe data visualization plays exactly the same role for analytics and increasingly uh, the big data analytics. Uh, of course, 10 years back when we got going, uh, no one had ever heard of the phrase big data. And uh, I must confess, we had no idea uh, what's kind of coming down the pipe. But as uh, the world has evolved, uh, a lot of new opportunities have come. Uh, and uh, the big data elements in terms of um, uh, combining human intelligence with machine intelligence to deliver high quality insights uh, has become a significant opportunity that uh, companies like ours uh, are chasing on. So, uh, what specifically do you do? Um, tell us a little bit about what is different about what you do and how you do what you do. Sure, sure. So, I think fundamentally, we part, we are we aspire to be the trusted analytics partner for large enterprises that are driving. Uh, 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 digital transformation in their businesses, right? I know it's a, a kind of large statement, but essentially it comes down to most businesses, uh, uh, and I'm talking about large Fortune 500 type businesses, are undergoing a significant digital transformation where uh, their footprint in the consumer world uh, is already moving towards the digital platforms, uh, whether it's the mobile revolution or the social revolution or any of the other mediums through which people are consuming content and interacting with brands. Uh, and uh, uh, in the B2B world as well, I think the promise of what we heard in the internet in terms of marketplaces, in terms of digital supply chains, in terms of uh, 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 rewiring of uh, uh, the business processes uh, 15 years back is actually coming to fruition now. And a lot of, the, a lot of these large uh, businesses are going through this change. And as they go through this change, they are looking for a partner who can help them make sense of uh, all the data that is kind of coming out of their systems uh, and help them organize it in the most optimal way and be able to then deliver insights which will be used by business people uh, to make better decisions. So if I were to take an example of something like a bank, uh, traditionally banks have invested in a lot of technology and they have uh, significant internal talent pool available to kind of make better decisions using the technology. But where the future is headed is uh, there are avenues that the, if you take, for example, the robot advisor revolution that we're going through, uh, the kind of skill sets, knowledge, technology inputs that are needed to kind of make an impact in such an area, uh, most banks are ill-equipped to handle such dramatic changes to their business landscape. Or if you take an innovation like blockchain, and what it could potentially do to the payments world, that's a fundamentally different um, uh, DNA of doing business. And which is where what these businesses find is partnering with a focused analytics business, which is able to combine 
the business knowledge in their context with capabilities and uh, working with a variety of sets of data because I think the uh, gone are the days when you had structured traditional data sets easily available in a relational database. Uh, today we are dealing with uh, a multitude of data sources, uh, not only internal data sources, but even external to the business and syndicated sources. And so there is a need to build technology systems which are flexible, which can combine all this and deliver insights. And our role has always been in helping the business users in harnessing analytics to deliver insights and which make business impact. So that the business impact could be in the form of higher revenues, better cost management, uh, managing customers better, increasing customer satisfaction. These are the kind of business metrics that we potentially help our customers succeed on. So let me see if I can um, decode what you said here. Mm -hmm. You know, my assessment of the analytics space is the software to do this kind of analytics has become more and more capable, at the same time, more and more complex to use. And yep. a trend that we are seeing in the market, in not only in analytics, in several other areas, but definitely in analytics, is, is there is a, a bit of a shift in the market from do it yourself to do it for me. And part of, the, part of the issue is that skilled people are very difficult to hire. You know, people who have all the skills of using these technologies, have all the uh, data science, you know, mathematics, statistics skills to be able to, you know, make sense of this data and be able to frame it in the context of business problems that they are dealing with, the domain knowledge, and so on, so on and so forth. The, that skill set is a very um, complex skill set and there aren't that many people in the world with that skill set and the ability of these companies, even if it's Fortune 500, even if they're willing to pay a lot, the ability of these companies to hire the skill set is limited. So this, in, in, in analytics in particular, I think this trend of do it for me is quite far along. And, and it seems like your company pretty much it's bank center in this trend area. Is that a correct observation? Uh, I, I would think so. I, I think for us, uh, our business model is predicated upon partnering with customers and helping them get better insights. And part of that involves, as you say, uh, the do it for me piece where we are combining our analysts, the human intelligence, with all the machine intelligence, which is the innovations in software in terms of uh, all the, I think in the last 10 years in computer science, there have been fairly fundamental uh, technology innovations that have happened. If you take all the uh, technology changes that Amazon Web Services is driving and multiple businesses are uh, built on top of it, uh, and increasingly Microsoft Azure as well, uh, uh, and uh, even basic things like, or, or uh, fundamental things like the MapReduce algorithm that Facebook come up with or uh, uh, what Google has done in its business area and so on. So businesses are struggling to deal with how do they adapt all of this into their uh, core business and are there partners available uh, who can do it for them. And uh, uh, that's the area that uh, potentially uh, uh, we are, that's a gap that we are potentially filling. Uh, another way to look at this is as companies become bigger, uh, the do-it-yourself uh, model becomes harder for them to execute on given the availability of talent is limited as also the complexity of data sources uh, starts uh, uh, really expanding for larger companies. And uh, they do need specialists who can help them combine uh, the business context with the uh, data science knowledge as well as the uh, mathematical skills uh, to be able to deliver the solutions that they need. So tell us how you built uh, Latent View. How did you win your first set of customers? Because I imagine 10 years back, um, the winning your first set of customers was, it wasn't obvious that people were willing to let all the let the, let you take all the data out and and do this as an outsourced service. Sure, sure, yeah. So I think our early years, 
were a lot of learning, right? So uh, first generation entrepreneurs uh, trying to kind of create a new market space. Uh, I must confess we were not the first to move. There were already uh, uh, some players who were trying to kind of uh, make an impact in some of these areas. But in our NIVT, we were looking at primarily the predictive space in analytics uh, when we mm -hmm. uh, got started. And what we found as we started engaging with uh, potential customers is in terms of maturity, there was a, a quite a breadth in terms of uh, how far uh, some companies were ready for uh, in terms of analysis. And lots of times they were talking about, hey, uh, you will need to help us first get the data infrastructure in place uh, or at least understand what data elements we need to collect so that we are in a better position to make these decisions. And I must say our early wins came from uh, working with uh, 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 an emerging market like India where we were helping uh, insurance firms. Uh, many of these were joint ventures or multinationals with Indian corporate houses and who were at a very, uh, who were growing at a very fast clip uh, after India deregulated the insurance market. And that's mm -hmm. where we cut our teeth. That's where we learned uh, uh, all elements of how to work with the kinds of customer data that uh, large financial services businesses have. And then uh, we started solving a suite of problems around customer management, uh, could be around cross-selling to existing customers, managing attrition or lapsation of customers, uh, as well as uh, another set of problems around distribution management, uh, primarily around um, uh, financial advisors and agents that insurance companies engage to go to market. And uh, that gave us a, a kind of body of knowledge and the confidence and the clarity in terms of what our uh, service offerings really ought to be uh, before we uh, uh, kind of launched our solutions uh, into the uh, largest technology market in the world in the United States. Uh, it took us again a couple of years because we hit the 2008-9 period where uh, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, given the credit crisis and uh, companies were going through uh, some soul searching in terms of defining uh, what's going to happen next. Uh, but since 2010, we have had a fantastic run in terms of uh, working with consumer-focused businesses primarily, but uh, increasingly with large industrial businesses as well in terms of helping them uh, make business impact with data. And uh, from a business model point of view, do you price or your projects as Service contracts. How is how what what is the business? That's sure, sure. I think our business model. The best way to look at our business model is we are uh, the trusted analytics partner for our clients. What that means is it's not about individual service contracts or individual projects. Uh, we typically set up a, a, what we call a center of excellence, uh, which is uh, a dedicated team which is working as mm -hmm. an extended. Uh, a virtual uh, uh, team for our client, and which is co-located, uh, small, uh, small numbers of this team is co-located with them in their geography, in their location, while a much larger, more scalable number is located in India, uh, where we are able to hire, train, and uh, manage uh, a very capable uh, set of analysts who are able to make business impact for them. And uh, so it's a, it's a long-term uh, partnership where uh, the large enterprises see the value of taking a long-term view in terms of what, how, sh how should they organize themselves, what skill sets, knowledge do they need, what resources do they need for them to kind of get going. And uh, as a business, we also get better visibility in terms of where we can go with a certain set of clients. And that's the way uh, the business is structured. In small number of cases, there are some business impact measures as well that we sign up to. Uh, but clearly to get there, there is a lot of steps that we need to clear in terms of understanding the lay of the land and uh, being able to measure and metricize a lot of the business impact measures before we sign up to incremental improvements that we can drive out there. But many of our contracts are primarily around uh, the setting up the centers of excellence for large enterprises. And um, I imagine given your business model, the company is bootstrapped. That's true. Uh, that's the choice we have made, and uh, we stay bootstrapped even today. Okay. And um, how large, uh, from a 
the headcount point of view is the operation now? Uh, we are fairly sizable now. We are uh, about 550 people uh, uh, spread globally across maybe uh, 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 India, United States, Europe, and uh, Singapore and Asia. And um, I would say in the last seven years, we have had a fantastic growth curve, so much so I think in the Deloitte Fast 50, we are the only company from India uh, which has been featured for seven consecutive years, and uh, we take a lot of pride in uh, not being – uh, just able to do this once or twice, but to do it in seven consecutive years. And so it, it, I imagine that a big portion of the 550 people are somehow or the other analytics, data science type of uh, people, right? That's correct. Uh, it, it's the combination of what I told you earlier, which is business data and math. So for the business, we get people from business schools. I think that's one of our differentiators in terms of how we have gone about building the pool of uh, talent that is needed to kind of make uh, uh, business impact. I always believe analytics has to be business-led, and it's not necessarily only about the math. Uh, but you do need to know uh, enough of the math, and you, need, you do need to be able to handle the computer science aspect, uh, which is primarily what is now being referred to as data science. So uh, talk to us a little bit about hiring these people. This is a complex hiring exercise, which is your value proposition, because your clients are not able to hire that combination of people and train them and so forth, and you specialize in that. That's why they give you the business. So what is the what is your strategy in terms of hiring these kinds of people? Sure. Certainly that's one of the reasons clients uh, work with us, but they also value um, the expertise that we gain over time, uh, one of the values we deliver to them is also what we call this cross-pollination of knowledge, where we are able to take ideas from a non-competitive sector, uh, like, say, in software technology, and apply it to consumer goods. Uh, but going back to your question, I think hiring is one of the core um, execution platforms for us to kind of focus on. and. Uh, we take a lot of care in terms of finding the right talent. India is a large country, uh, but uh, even in a large talent pool like this, there's a limited number of really capable people who can potentially make business impact. Uh, so we spend a fair amount of time in um, uh, testing uh, pro prospective candidates, and the acceptance ratios are uh, very, very stringent. We probably have only one out of every 60 people who apply to us. Uh, and uh, uh, probably one out of every 35, 40 people that we actually end up meeting. Uh, so there is a emphasis in this area in terms of finding the right people. Uh, I think it always helps to ha uh, that we made a choice to be located in Chennai, uh, in South India. Uh, uh, I keep joking how uh, Chennai is the kind of open secret in the technology business. Uh, there are multiple large technology companies uh, which, which have chosen to make Chennai their big base uh, for knowledge workers, uh, but we don't get as much headlines as uh, other parts of India uh, in uh, doing this. Uh, and that has helped us in attracting, because there are not so many companies who are doing exactly the same area as ours uh, in Chennai, uh, we, we are among the leading uh, recruiters in the space, and uh, we have consciously worked towards building a work culture that attracts uh, uh, quality talent, uh, and then uh, we work very hard in retaining them uh, uh, over a long period of time. So uh, you said you have, for seven years, you've been growing really fast and have been acknowledged and, and uh, uh, recognized for that kind of growth rate. Where are you now? Revenues, profitability? IPO plans, competition, what the market has evolved in the 10 years that you've been in business. Where are sure. you currently? Right, right. Well, the market has certainly evolved. I think from where we were, uh, uh, there are multiple uh, small uh, analytics firms that have kind of come up uh, with various, uh, there, there are of course companies which have similar business models to ours. There are also companies which have taken a platform oriented or um, uh, product-oriented approaches to solving problems as well. Uh, and this is happening globally, so it's not just in companies with uh, India as a base, it's happening in the Valley, it's happening in different parts of uh, um, uh, uh, the technology world. Uh, I think 
we have been lucky in the momentum that we have been able to gather and the execution that we have done allows us to be among the leading players in the space. Um, and we continue to gain momentum uh, in uh, growing our business. Uh, we haven't spent, uh, to be honest, a lot of time worrying about um, unlocking the value that we are creating because I, I believe today it's still early days and there is a lot of opportunity uh, in front of us. And uh, so the focus right now is on execution, uh, meeting customer needs really well so that we retain our customers, attracting high quality talent and uh, helping uh, to develop our footprint in more and more sectors. So uh, you haven't said anything about revenues, profitability, IPO plans. Could you please comment on those? Sure, yeah. We are actually a private company, so uh, as we are discussing earlier, so we are bootstrapped, we have stayed away from uh, all elements of um, uh, engaging with uh, the markets uh, and investing. Uh, as I said, IPO is uh, potentially one of the ways in which uh, the value will get unlocked, but uh, there are no active plans today. Uh, it will be, I think we are still in the value creation phase rather than uh, the value unlocking phase. Uh, and uh, one of the things we have been very clear about right from the beginning is uh, sustainable, profitable growth. Uh, so uh, uh, given that we are bootstrapped, it's been uh, a good discipline to have that we make choices which ensures we are always profitable and uh, we have no reason to go out and raise money uh, based on uh, the business health. Uh, of course, if there is money which is going to give us a strategic uh, jump, then uh, that is something for us to consider. But for, for now, uh, we have been pretty comfortable with the way we have been. Well, bootstrap companies don't have a choice but to manage a profitable company. You have to manage a profitable company, otherwise you have... Sure. You can There's survive. no one else going to help you fill the hole. Right. And um, so can, we, can you give us a range? Are we talking about a $50 million company, $100 million company? You know, $200 million company, what size company have you built in 10 years? So I, I think we are on a journey to get to the $100 million mark. We have cleared uh, multiple other milestones already. Uh, I think mm -hmm. in the next two or three years, uh, we have a very good shot at uh, getting to the $100 million mark. Okay. And um, what do you think of this unicorn mania that is um, running through the industry right now, including India. Actually, India has gotten quite crazy on, on this whole in unicorn mania. Right, right, yeah. Now, I guess, uh, Shramana, you've probably seen this a lot more than I have, uh, having tracked a lot of this. Uh, I read it in the business press as well, just as uh, 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 most other people. I think uh, there are the technology sector has always had its waves in terms of uh, uh, the, the concepts which help in uh, attracting a lot of uh, high quality talent in uh, creating new businesses uh, and uh, that's probably uh, the kind of um, there is a need for some of that hype to attract uh, money into the business talent into the business uh, and uh, but the the only sad part is uh, uh, the mortality rate uh, tends to go up at some point in time. Uh, from our own perspective, uh, we, we kind of, as much as possible, tune out uh, a lot of this and try to kind of keep our focus on execution and uh, uh, just uh, be very clear in terms of uh, finding the right market segments, uh, ensuring we are building a profitable business, and that we can sustain it over a long period of time. I think any business which picks those elements and maybe does even better than us uh, has a very good shot at doing whatever the definitions of unicorns are asking them to do. What, um, where, what is your forecast on the analytics market going forward? Oh, what I are think, the trends? Uh, How it, does it evolve? Sure, yeah. So I think we are still at a very, very early stage. As I keep telling my team, uh, we have just crossed the first kilometer in a marathon, so there is a long distance to go. Uh, and, and the kind of new challenges, innovations that uh, are ahead of us are increasingly around uh, automation, uh, machine intelligence, and uh, uh, humans enabling machines a lot more. Uh, I, I think the, uh, some of which we have already started seeing. I think what Tesla is doing to the automobile sector in terms of a combination of hardware and software, uh, um, uh, I, I think 10 years back we would have probably not believed if someone was telling us uh, such innovations are going to come. 
So I'm a big believer in uh, changes that are likely to happen in terms of uh, adoption of wearables, adoption of virtual reality, uh, adoption of um, uh, sensors and data that is coming out from sensors in making better business decisions. So there is a lot of uh, innovation in front of us, and uh, that's what keeps us excited uh, in the quest for uh, identifying new areas that we can learn from and then help our customers as their trusted analytics partners to derive more insights. All right. Well, um, thank you for being with us here, uh, Venkat. Uh, congratulations on building a very fast growth bootstrapped company in a cutting edge area. And um, it, it, what's interesting to me in the story that you told me a few years ago and also added to it today is that you've taken a very old uh, model of building companies out of India, which was staffing essentially IT resources, and then put very uh, high-end skill sets, analytic skill sets, cutting edge skill sets in technology and, uh, and business and mathematics statistics, and built a, a very interesting company with a lot of differentiation and a lot of defensibility. Um, you know, this kind of putting, pulling together this kind of skill sets is not easy. Training these kind of skill set is not easy. And, and of course, winning the trust of the customer base to give you such mission critical uh, analytics, predictive analytics, um, and you know, work is is quite an achievement. So congratulations and thanks for uh, inspiring our audience with your story. Sure, thank you. Uh, much of the credit goes to actually the fantastic team that we have. Uh, you can uh, you you can only uh, initiate some of these revolutions, but a lot of this is achieved only with some great minds uh, helping us through the journey at every step. So thank you. All right. Well, uh, we are going to go to the entrepreneur pitch portion of the um, session today. So before you start um, doing your presentations, I want to set some expectations for the presenters. Just know that the only reason we are here is to help you become successful. We have no other agenda. You are obviously doing your best. But our audience is largely first-time entrepreneurs who are all climbing a very steep learning curve. And we have experience. We have brought together not just our own experience, but the experience of hundreds of entrepreneurs who have helped us build this platform and, and you know, bring the knowledge and the insights and so forth. So we, using that knowledge base, that network, we can accelerate your learning, we can accelerate your journey. That is the whole agenda of One Million by One Million, is to help you move faster, move more efficiently, move more precisely through the entrepreneurial journey. So feel safe, feel like you have people here who, are, who want you to succeed and Feel free to discuss what you need to discuss, what roadblocks you're encountering, and so forth. Now, you may disagree with my feedback. People come here with you know, preconceived ideas. And the whole point of this discussion is to give you perspective, different perspective, new perspective, with which you may be able to Remove some of those roadblocks that are helping you, that are hindering you from progress. However, you may not be ready to listen to this kind of feedback, especially if it's substantially different from your current mental model. Shifting mental models is a lengthy process. It does not happen overnight. It certainly does not happen in a 10-minute conversation. You're going to have to sleep over it. You're going to have to think, think about it and so forth. So it's okay if you disagree or if it takes you time to absorb feedback, recordings will be available. You can take your time to simmer. You can, you can take your time to think about it. The other thing that I want to set expectations around is funding. There is a big myth out there in the industry that entrepreneurship equals financing. No, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits 
financing and exit are optional. Not all businesses can raise money. Not all businesses should raise money. And raising money doesn't guarantee success. So please keep those in mind. There are some very specific cases in which you need to raise money, you should be raising money. There are specific requirements for raising money, etc. All of these you need to take into account in this de designing your financing strategy. So don't come in assuming that the first thing you need to do is raise money. This is a working session. We're going to work with you. We're going to try to give you some material with which you can put one foot before the other and move forward. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much why we are here. Also, to the audience who's not pitching, do ask questions. Do participate by asking questions in the public chat. Make sure you set your pub chat to send to all participants not to me or not to Maureen. That will be private chats, but you want to talk to the whole group, your peer group here. And uh, asking good questions is an art, and that is what helps you learn the most. So definitely ask questions. I, when I open up the line, you can ask questions also by calling in. We're going to start with Minda Aguhop. Minda, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Great. Thank you so much for this call. Um, I'm really excited to, to share. So I'm from New York City and Silicon Valley. Um, and um, next slide. I've been working on smart solutions for peak health. Um, our target audience is, um, market is seniors and disabled folks. So peak focus is my company. And um, go to the next slide. Again, our focus is on seniors. Um, next slide, please. And what we're designing is a mobile app um, that also works on um, not just a phone, but on a watch. And it's actually a package that's sold with a preloaded app. And what this does is automatic fall detection. So it's like I fallen and can't get up for Apple Watch and iPhone. And mm -hmm. what this um, app also does is it um, allows families to keep in touch with their seniors or disabled um, members of their family, find out where they are, um, get reminders about different things um, from health reminders like medication reminders, things like that. And you can see basic sensor data as well, like it steps, pulse, and integrate it with other um, devices that have data. Next slide, please. So, uh, Minda, you just wrote, rattled out a whole list of stuff. Have you considered where the competitive landscape and figured out where is the gap because there are obviously a lot of senior focused apps in the market and and all these different things that you're talking about people are doing some of that where is the yeah. gap where is the opportunity to really make a difference and, and do something differentiated that's a great question so um this next slide talks about the the seniors that we're focusing on. So I think that most of the uh, devices out there focus on seniors as a whole. They look at the senior market as one market. We're looking at a specific segment of what we call high-income tech-savvy seniors. And this is a group that people have traditionally seen as not tech-savvy, not interested in tech, but I've seen and we have seen from our current research that there is groups of seniors who are very interested in specifically the iPhone and um, in high tech. And there aren't any products that are specifically targeting these seniors or their tech savvy families. So as you can see, um, this slide talks about the um, estimated total mar market, not just for safety monitoring in general, but for those high income tech savvy seniors. And we see a really big market. Even if we have a lot of competition specifically targeting that market, we see a pretty big piece of the pie for us. So if you look at the next slide, we're going to focus on right now the urban seniors, like New York City. There's nearly one million seniors in this specific segment I just mentioned, as well as San Francisco. You can see the next slide. It's about a quarter of the number of New Yorkers, but those seniors are from very tech savvy families, as um, mm -hmm. could probably be drawn from that segment. So. Um, the way we're going to approach it is we're looking not at just um, seniors in general, also looking at veterans. So we have some contact with um, San Francisco VA Medical Center, for example. 
um, looking at specific needs like post-acute um, health care. Um, another segment we've, uh, we've uh, identified are retiring physicians who really love gadgets <laughs> and a few other groups. So we're being very targeted in who we're approaching and have some um, connections and distribution channels there that we've been building. Um, in the next slide, you can see some of our traction. Uh, I've been working on this for the software for about um, a year. Um, been developing the concept for a little bit longer than that because we started out as a hardware play and then made the switch to software play. Um, mm -hmm. So from a totally untargeted email campaign, we got nine pre-orders. And we had three pilots going on in uh, New York City. We were just about to start another one. And um, I've been really lucky and um, blessed to have um, Minerva Tantoco as a, a, a mentor who uh, connects me with uh, New York City as she's the CTO of New York City. And we've been building um, and writing grants for um, in a, building an emergency system that can be used um, during disasters or epidemics, such as Hurricane Sandy and other things. Um, so my background is in that kind of work. And so um, this is the kind of thing that we're hoping to build some more traction around. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the specific issue that we're dealing with right now. Um, been, again, really lucky to have these pilot studies and with Pace University, um, a local university in New York City, has a gerund technology program that specializes in um, educating students on building technology for seniors. Um, really great program. We've been doing pilots with them. And through them, I got connected with, um, with a major mobile carrier. Um, and we are ready to, um, to, to develop a product together. The issue that we're having right now is just completing um, the alpha we have now so it becomes uh, be a robust beta. And um, we've been bootstrapping and are out of money. So um, I've been, like I said, focusing on, on these grants, um, done a little bit of crowdfunding, mostly with family and friends, um, continuing that, but really um, feeling like the way I'm seeing the landscape or our issues right now is that we need to finish the app in order to get this um, product to our um, potential pre-order customers. Um, and then all of our team is working part time right now, so we're, we're like really, <laughs> we're really um, on the edge right now. So Minda, the, I'll, I'll go back to what I said. The first thing that struck me is that it's not clear to me what you're building because I don't think as a bootstrap company you're going to be able to build all of those things that you rattled off. You're going to need to zero in on one thing that you deliver as a functionality that is a differentiated functionality that that you can build and get traction around. So first thing in advising you, I the first thing I would do is to understand what is the competitive landscape and where what is that functionality with which you can get a get a first product out, minimum viable product out. And so try to answer that question. And whatever you know, part-time resources you have, then it would be very easy for you to channel those resources to drive this to a finished minimum viable product. That is a that is an essential step. But to get there, it seems like you don't have clarity on what is it that you're that will be a viable product to go to market with. Huh, okay. uh, can you please uh, stop this noise in the background? Um, it's hard to mute. do a call so like this with noise in the background. Um, so that's my first feedback. It, it, it's just that the feature set is impossible to understand, and, and the positioning of the product is impossible to understand without a competitive analysis. Um, so so it, this, it seems like the product is not positioned for me, and, and then I, that has immense repercussions. It has go-to-market issues. It has product design issues and product development issues. You will never be able to finish this product because you don't know exactly where you're going to position this product. And you're trying to pack too much functionality in, whereas this is not that complicated a product to get out, especially for the length of the time that you've been in business, the fact that you've not been able to get a 
uh, a minimum viable product out tells me that you you don't have a positioning, you don't have a clear understanding of what is it that you're building and what is it that is going to give you a market positioning. That's my first feedback. And um, and I think that's something that you need to close the loop on. Your funding options are very limited right now. Given where you are, your funding options are very limited. I would say friends and family is the only funding option you have. Um, I don't think there's any other funding option. Crowdfunding could be, but that's about it. But if, if you've already run a crowdfunding campaign and have not delivered to that group, the same platform will not let, let you run another crowdfunding campaign, I suppose. Thank you. Okay, the, so so those are, I would say, the biggest missing piece for me is, is what is this product? Um, I'm actually glad to hear that because we've been focusing on um, building partnerships and marketing. It's nice to be able to say that. I don't think you should do any now. of that. None of that is going to work. Partnership, marketing, none of that is going to work unless you can figure out what this product is. I hear that. And I have the answer to that, so I appreciate the focus that you're giving okay. me right now. I appreciate it. There are ways of doing partnerships and so forth, but you're not in the, you know, there is a methodology to what happens first and what happens second and what happens third in building a business like this. I think your sequence of the steps is wrong. Okay, got it. Um, I started out talking about building the product first and was, was – hand slapped there too, but it sounds like this is good advice at this point. Okay, good. All right, good luck, Linda. Swami Ganeshan, you're up again. next. You're welcome. Hi, so, Swami on the line? Here, can you... Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, so I'm uh, Swami Ganesan, right now I'm calling from uh, Chennai, which is home. Uh, but uh, Ishi uh, started out of uh, New York. Um, and I'm primarily here because I read one of your uh, venture fictions, and I seem to be doing half of that fiction. I'm here to understand if the rest of the fiction, uh, you know, I can make the rest of it come true. So um, okay. what Ishi Shakti um, is, a, uh, is a marketplace of, uh, of, of, of vendors and service providers that cater to the needs of low-income women uh, in India, typically tier three, uh, uh, tier four markets, and even in rural India. Um, and one of the key features of this uh, marketplace is that there is a searchable database, uh, basically a library of content where women can come in, uh, search for um, information on uh, nutrition, good sanitation habits, uh, closest um, doctor, where can they get their lab tests done, and uh, so on. And um, and they can even participate in a structured curriculum in some cases. For example, in nutrition, we have a small curriculum on uh, protein, carbohydrates, and what a balanced diet is, and what uh, and so on. So it's a, a test curriculum. Uh, and they can earn, say, 20 points uh, uh, for doing that. And what the marketplace offers then is an opportunity for them to ex uh, exchange these points for um, a coupon at the store uh, for, you know, 100 rupees off on purchase of 1,000 rupees or more products and services. So um, the, what the original goal with which we, uh, the reason we, the, the marketplace is structured this way with this uh, small points model is, uh, we uh, started out to address the uh, challenge of public health, primary health challenges of women in rural India. And one of the key uh, challenges is the information barrier as well as the social and gender barriers. So we created this database of uh, information, uh, custom content on uh, uh, what uh, a seven minute video on what uh, the new, uh, you know, um, carbohydrates and protein diet should be or what what should you do, uh, uh, when should you do cervical screen, uh, cancer screening and things like that to address specific issues for women uh, between the age of 18 and 35. Um, and we uh, built this marketplace in order to keep them coming. Uh, we made it into a curriculum and then we are exchanging these uh, points for products and services. In terms of the, the vendors and, sub, uh, and the service providers in the marketplace, uh, we choose basically uh, local Kirana stores, uh, beauty parlors, medical stores, 
uh, who participate in this program, and we help them structure a marketing campaign uh, on 15% off on those products at, you know, about uh, 500 rupees of your bill and things like that. And, um, uh, and, and this is the, the marketplace right now. What we have in place is a 20, uh, is a pilot in the state of Madhya Pradesh with 20 stores and about 1,000 women participating. And uh, who pays? And the important question is who pays in this model, right? So um, the women don't pay for anything. They come in and participate uh, in a, in a ten, uh, I mean, watch a 10-minute video and earn points or answer a quiz uh, or uh, participate in an activity and earn points. The vendors pay a listing fee and a commission on sales right now. And uh, we have about 20 vendors and 1,000 women who participate in this marketplace. And uh, we do about $1,000 of transaction uh, uh, per uh, week and a half, per week now, depending on the season, uh, uh, through this platform uh, at the vendors, and we earn that uh, commission on sales. Uh, and the, the goal is really to, uh, you know, now considering um, this is a typically a type of customer we are looking to, um, uh, you know, we can further segment the customers into uh, in, uh, into uh, the the income level even within the market that we are addressing. Our, uh, our focus has been on uh, looking at the customers in the age segment because, um, if they, you know, we, we acquire these customers in groups uh, by going to schools, by going to uh, your local uh, village uh, events and things like that. So they, they register with us and they participate in this program. Um, and the goal is to um, to empower them with information, connect them to services and products that will improve the quality of their life. And um, and uh, so the Kirana stores uh, and the other stores and service providers who participate with us are happy because they are able to get uh, you know bulk customers and uh, they are able to uh, group their uh, spend from you know 100 rupees, 200 rupees to our average spend uh, per customer is now 550 rupees. When we started out, say, with the pilot in July 2015, time was around 140 rupees. So more women are spending uh, because they earn the points for free. Uh, it uh, you know they don't have to essentially for for using the points they'll have to spend money because uh, the, the vendors uh, are giving discount. So uh, this is the basic model. Uh, we have, and um, what we, uh, the, the value offered to the retailers is the business, and um, sort of a rewards program wrapper around their existing business. Uh, nothing more structured to it at the moment, at least. On the, uh, on the, the value that we, we, are, we were hoping to sell uh, to the women is an opportunity to come and quickly uh, search and learn about something that they care about. And this is, uh, if you look at our customer segment 13 to um, yeah, 25, which is about uh, 400 of our 1,000 uh, participants, um, this participation rate is very high, and they come in frequently, and they um, they purchase what I call high beta products. In other words, they, they, they exchange it for bakery coupons and so on. So, so I have a couple of questions. Um, hold on. So um, the the are you running this 1,000 women pilot in one village, perhaps, or one Town in a in a in a town uh, in one town uh, which covers about uh, we cover about a few villages around here. Yeah, you you can say it's about essentially one place. And uh, so, what does that represent? This one thousand women in that geography. What does that represent? Is it uh, one hundred percent of the households? Is it twenty percent of the households? What are we talking about? It is not uh, as a percentage of house. Uh, we um, one you're talking about a catchment area of uh, thirty five thousand. Um, uh, thirty five thousand. Uh, we registered actively one thousand and working with them. Um, okay. But, uh, and how did you recruit these women? These one thousand. How did how did they get chosen or recruited to this pro the pilot program? Um, we want to focus on low to middle income and uh, um, and age distribution. These are our keys. So low to middle income, 
we recruited uh, to the Anganwadis and other community centers where the women can come and congregate and participate. Um, but how, the, what is the, the process of recruiting them? Do you have to go talk to everyone and, and sell them this concept? What, how, how did people find out about it and how did they choose to participate? Yeah, I missed that. So it's a, basically a franchise model. We have a, a, a franchise manager and two or three, three employees uh, uh, who go out to these community centers. We have an app developed which basically mm -hmm. scans their uh, Aadhaar card and then in 10 seconds, we have all your information with consent. And okay. uh, we only need one additional information, which is your mobile number. So with that information, I have your demographic data and your uh, region, where, where, I, where you're from, and, uh, um, and your mobile number. So from there, we start- And they all have mobiles then? Oh yeah, I mean, 100% uh, of them have Access to mobile. Uh, about 75, 80 percent of them have uh, their personal mobile phone, and it's, okay. again, it's a little lower depending on age group. So, okay. um, so my so next question is, is: What is the business model for you? What, what, where, what is your of all these numbers that you have? There's no information about what money you are making. Not, is there a slide so on that? No, and uh, because I'm not making um, uh, uh, that much uh, uh, money right now. And so the, the, those are the some of the questions. In other words, we have this, uh, we want to control this product market. In other words, I feel that we should be selling um, some of these uh, uh, these products ourselves because we get, um, again, uh, uh, we, we get a commission on sales, but that's 2% on $1,000, and uh, that's uh, $20 a week. So that's not going to uh, push anything. The first goal is to see if we can get to operational, uh, you know, run the franchise uh, and on the standby on it. So all the content are digital, so there is no cost of um, replicating it uh, other than uh, finding. Uh, so I mean, basically, we I don't have an answer, uh, a clear answer. That, that's what I'm trying to. Um, uh, what I've been trying to focus on is the traction. Um, to see if I can bring the woman in one time, second time, third time, and have the spend uh, at the uh, at the stores, and see if that cycle and the retail cycle are running. Um, and that's so. You I need a couple time. of things here, Swami. Um, yes, of course, you need to understand traction, but there are two things missing for me. What where, yes. what is the business model of the franchise? You know, the, the people who are going to set up this franchise, how do they make money? How do they cover their costs? How do they make their profits? That's one question, vital question uh, that you need to solve. And, and two is, what is your business model? Let's say you're going to be creating these franchise, but what, you know, what do you get out of that franchise's earnings? What percentage comes to you? And how do you build you know, you need you have operational costs, and also you don't you're not building a business just to to not make money. You're building a business to make money. So, what is that money making opportunity for you? So, you know what I would like to like you to start thinking about, and I'm happy to help you think this through. Is it, what happens if you can create this network of women around women's health as the core kind of anchor connection point and, and you generate goodwill, you generate trust and so forth, what is the best way to monetize that? And that, I would kind of think of it in this model and then you need to have all these pieces fall into place. If you're talking about selling them products then on top of that, then are you working with retailers or are you becoming a retailer yourself? This is a question you're already asking yourself, this is good. Um, but then are there other models, are there other kinds of ways that you can monetize this audience, but, but there needs to be a monetizing, a monetizing model here. Yeah, um, and I totally agree. And the, the theory that uh, uh, when we're sitting in, uh, in classrooms and trying to uh, uh, think was that we create this, uh, uh, this network and then uh, this becomes, a, for example, right now we do data survey and we provide a one-page report to our retailers on uh, what age group uh, shop at your store, what uh, what kind of products. I mean, we, we, 
again, uh, uh, trying to dabble to understand doing an analytics on the uh, uh, on the on the rate of uh, uh, points exchange and uh, uh, was did it exchange that uh, was it exchange at a you know a general store or a electronics or mobile talk and so on and so forth. So, um, but of course we don't have a sizable uh, number or to um, to uh, to call this the data uh, uh, business at this point. Um, and of course, we are hoping, like you said, a brand, uh, uh, trying to create a brand around uh, quality of life, improving products and services, and be a channel for corporates uh, to co-brand them and, um, and, uh, and, and channel the product directly to women through our network. Um, at that point, we've become a, 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 the A1 like model. Um, I'm not sure. That so, makes the, uh, I think that's the most obvious one where you, you basically sell related products, women's health related products and and that's that's a very obvious model because you're you you know, the you, it's a retailer model basically. It's a value added so, uh, value added retailer model. Right. So so maybe um so based on the uh in our, uh what um so my challenge is, uh, you know, I've tried to create some partnerships with nonprofits so that I'm, uh, my content, I, I don't have to reinvent the cycle and a lot of people are working in the, on the content structure and getting the information. Um, and so I, I, I have some partnerships to that end. Now I'm trying to think about this uh, as a retail uh, model and um, and track the metrics on uh, on the spend retention and uh, and then build a business uh, around uh, this and you know we based on what we are seeing we believe three thousand to four thousand women per franchise uh, will at least uh, make it operationally sustainable based on their shopping rates uh, in our current uh, franchise. But uh, my theory doesn't hold because. It is a tier three market in one corner of the country. It might be entirely different in a in an urban um, uh, or even tier. No, uh, but tier I I, I think you're missing the obvious here. The obvious to me is that if the if the community is going to be built around women's health, then the products you should be selling should be around women's health, and and you you become the retailer, and and the products you you sell have correlation with what you're teaching them. Okay. Um, so, so and, and build the business uh, that way. Then the business hangs together. If you're kind of doing, trying to take, you know, very small commissions out of random retailers' budgets and so forth, this business is not going to scale. It's not going to be interesting by any stretch of imagination. So, see if you can find a core set of women's health-related products that actually have relevance in this context, and it has to be differentiated also. Otherwise. You know, you're going to be competing with the local stores. Of course, you can offer them terms and dis discounts and so forth, which makes it attractive for them to buy from you as opposed to the local stores. So this discount and everything that you're doing with other retailers, you can do it yourselves and, and work directly with the manufacturers. Okay. You have to so learn the retail you, business this, effectively. This is what you're going to do. You, you need to learn the retail business. Is this relevant um, to your, your you, I mean, um, would you be able to guide us in uh, um, in in that retail focus? I am looking at it as a retail business myself. Um, so. Yes, we can. I can certainly guide you. Um, the scalability of the business is going to be heavily dependent on technology. Now, the question is, how much technology can you fool into this? Um, you know, this model is something that you're going to need to think through. So, so the answer is yes, I can help you. I can guide you through this process, yes. Okay. If you try to do so, everything uh, manually, it's going to be hard for you to scale this in any way. Then you're going to be doing a very small regional kind of thing. But if you want to do it with efficiency, if you want to make it an attractive business, it could be a you know, find non-profit or that doesn't generate any money, that's one type of business, in which case we are not the best place for you to do this with. But if you want to really build a business, that's something I can guide you with. Yeah, I mean, this is a, we, we are structuring this as a, um, as a private limited. And uh, you mentioned uh, technology for scalability, just in terms of operations and so on. 
Um, okay. I mean, I guess um, the, the, I have the information now. Um, I'll, I'll start to think about it. As a okay. Business and, I'll talk more about okay. how to use the program uh, shortly after this, after Alpha's presentation. So you can hang around and ask more questions towards the end of the session. Okay. All right. Good luck, Swami. Alpa, you're up next. This wonderful opportunity. Um, this is my first, this is my second time presenting my company. Um, so my name is Alpa Patel. I have a company in an early startup stage um, called Spaces. Um, we, next slide, please. So Spaces is, um, it's a startup, um, the simplest way I can describe it is house, the platform house for hospitality and commercial spaces. So we, um, what we want to do is we want to create a platform um, where we're bringing the ecosystem together of um, hospitality and commercial businesses that are looking to design, build, or renovate their spaces and then connect them with professionals and manufacturers to um, work on their projects. So the platform is going to be a visual community with uh, content, uh, primarily photos of interior and exterior spaces of uh, hospitality and commercial um, spaces. And uh, the, the goal is to um, attract businesses to come to find design inspiration and find and collaborate with the perfect professional, such as an architect, designer, or contractor, and discover products. So essentially what we look to do is these are the three stakeholders on the platform, our target customers and their problems. Currently there's no easy way for hospitality business to find design inspiration, connect with the industry professional like architect, designer, general contractor, and then find products for your space. So uh, the way this came about is um, my father was renovating his um, property. Uh, he has a motel in Texas. And at the same time, I was renovating my home in California. So I used the house platform and it really made it very easy for me to figure out what I like, find professionals and get everything done quickly because in my home we had a flood, so I didn't have a lot of time. So my father was going through this process of renovating his motel and I was trying to help him and I couldn't find any place where I can go for like house where I could find design inspiration, find the professionals and find manufacturers um, for his project. Um, so hence, um, these are our stakeholders, hospitality businesses um, and industry professionals um, and then manufacturers. Manufacturers are any company that's producing a product that goes into any commercial space. Next slide, please. So, um, Alpha, it sounds like what you're trying to do is is a house kind of marketplace for specifically for the hospitality uh, construction industry, or hospitality industry that is trying to remodel. Exactly, and um, our our um, our goal is to eventually be a platform for commercial spaces, not just hospitality. But um, I was reading this book by Peter Thiel. And he says, um, when you're in a big market, um, you want to start with a small, narrow niche uh, focus. So hospitality is an industry that I know I grew up in. Um, uh, all my family's in the hotel business. And so um, I decided since I encountered the problem uh, with helping my father renovate his property, I chose to start the, um, the focus on hospitality. but we will um, take content from um, architects and designers for all commercial spaces on the platform. So we'll leave but with these are, these are different spaces and different kinds of, I, I don't think you should think about commercial in general and, and, and it's not clear to me what is the size of the hospitality marketplace. So the hospitality marketplace could be sizable in its own right, and in which case you should, it's going to take you many years to just build the hospitality marketplace. Marketplaces don't happen overnight. Marketplaces take a long time to come together to, to scale. 
So, you know, right now I would say um, the next five years or seven years of your life, if you if you choose to do this, is going to be focused on building the hospitality marketplace, and you shouldn't even think about commercial. So, in this presentation, commercial should not even be mentioned. Okay, that's a very good point, and that was one of my questions to you: is should we focus exclusively on hospitality, or should we allow others other content as well? The reason I say that is because architects and designers they don't just design hospitality spaces. They design all commercial types of spaces generally. And so we, we felt like if they're coming on the platform and putting content for hospitality, why not take in content from other spaces as well? No, you shouldn't. That's precisely because people specialize, even architects specialize, architects who specialize, who have portfolios in uh, hospitality will have an easier time getting other hospitality projects than getting office space kind of projects. So, uh, so so I think there are specific people who have specific, I'm not saying they don't ever do it, but if you can create a hospitality marketplace, hospitality renovation, construction and renovation marketplace, and if you can bring in architects who actually have specialized expertise in that space, that area, the it's gonna be a much tighter positioning Okay. than trying to do everything. So in 1 million by 1 million, our philosophy is position as tightly as possible. Okay. As precisely, as tightly, as crisply, and as clearly as possible. Any time when you have, a, have to make a choice between, shall I do this or that or both, choose one or the other and not both. Got it. Thank you, that's very good advice. Um, so our market size is uh, hospitality construction renovation is approximately $45 billion market. Um, there's about uh, 1 million restaurants uh, in the U.S., 4,000 new opening every year. Um, the beauty, so for House, the platform, most people renovate their homes maybe once, twice uh, in their lifetime, like a kitchen or, or any major renovation. But in hospitality, you have to do it every, four to seven years. You have to keep renovating because those are spaces that get used a lot and it's a cycle, it's part of the business cycle. Um, so it's a healthy market. Um, the commercial market is much larger, obviously it, the overall commercial market is, uh, and, and these, you know, one thing I need to do is I need to drill down on, um, on the opportunity, the market um, market size to figure out how much is being spent on marketing because this is this is how much is being spent, $45 billion is being spent on call hospitality construction and renovation. But out of that $45 billion, how much is being spent to capture that business? So that's the, the, the part that I haven't figured out yet. Um, so well, what's my true I market size? You, you need to understand what part of this, this market can, because this consists of, products and, and everything, right? This is like, you know, what you need to do is your bottom-up TAM analysis, which is what's missing from here. This is all a bunch of top-down numbers and, and that doesn't help you understand what is the real market opportunity in front of you. Okay. Um, so uh, basically my, my main question uh, to not today was just around marketing. This is a, uh, what we're looking to build is a, a a mobile and uh, web platform where we bring these three stakeholders together. Um, so the key is to hit critical mass. And the, the first step is to bring content, which means bring the industry professionals on the platform, the architects, designers, general contractors. Once they come, they show the content, and then the businesses come to see the content, and then the product right. manufacturers will naturally follow because the, that's where their customers are. Um, per, so your first, first base is marketing this concept to architects, and architects are always looking for additional avenues through which they can market themselves. So you need to find a critical mass of architects who are willing to put their hospitality, who work in hospitality, who are willing to put out their hospitality portfolios and, and generate, you know, uh, and, and you need to cover certain geographies because it's people tend to work with in hospitality projects, unless they're very large hospitality projects, people tend to work with local architects. 
if they're very large hospitality projects, then they would work with people from elsewhere. But if you're talking about motels and stuff, I don't imagine that people will be working for anything other than working with anybody other than local architects. Yeah, and, and our, our target market is small to mid-sized businesses, obviously like the Four Seasons and the Marriott's, but the Ritz-Carlton's are getting built by the, the Genslers of the world, you know, the, the largest companies. So we're looking to build this platform for hospitality businesses, um, restaurants, bars, hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, inns. So, um, you know, uh, uh, really, it's how do I how do I build critical mass? And one of the I, one of the ways I think I can do that is um, there's a company called Hoover's, and I've done some uh, uh, research. There's about 40,000 architects on um, their database. Um, one of the thought was, you know, get, creating free listings for everyone and uh, pumping it into the platform, and then allowing architects to claim their profiles. Once they claim it, they can upload content. So pre-populating the platform with all of the business's information already there, and hopefully they can, they'll come and claim their profiles. So that's one way we're thinking we can try and hit critical mass with professionals. You're gonna need to, you're gonna need to focus on hospitality. The Hoover is not gonna identify architects as hospitality architects. You're gonna to need to do research and find people who work in, pick a geography, pick a set of hospitality architects, architects with hospitality portfolios in that geography who are, who work in the small to medium sized project category and, and, and personally build those relationships and bring them onto your platform and, and create one geography. Once you have the architects, then go, you know, then you need to market to the, the hospitality companies who are looking to do these projects. You need to need a marketing strategy for that. So you have to, geography is a very, it's going to be a very important piece of it. And hospitality architects, architects with hospitality portfolio is going to be a very important piece of it. So, so you're going to need to find specific people. It needs to be very targeted. It's, it's not so much that you need huge volume to, to go to the next level with, but you do need 50 architects in a particular geography and so to be able to take that out and market it to, you know, a bunch of hospitality uh, companies in that particular geography. So it is a chicken and egg, but that's how all marketplaces get built organically and one step at a time, put one step before the other. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Okay. Okay, folks, um, I'm gonna spend some time talking about one million by one million and how to use the program. If you like the program, what we're doing here, please refer serious entrepreneurs to the program. We are you know, we're only interested in working with people who actually are going to spend the time, you know, to build their businesses. It's, building a business is a very lengthy, very involved, very intense process. And that doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to be something that you can just wing it. It is a matter of learning a lot of things and doing a lot of things over a sustained period of time. And we are looking for entrepreneurs who have that mindset. And if you do have that mindset, if you want us to help you learn all the pieces of how to put one foot before the other, we can definitely do that. That's why we are here. That's what we do um, in general. So you can use the program to do that. All the resources are at 1mby1m.com. You can start with the blog, which is an intense uh, and powerful resource that a lot of people are learning from. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is a very um, you know, low cost entry point into the program. You can double click on a particular topic of whatever area that you're trying to learn and, and just learn from the books. You can also uh, go to the website and you'll find tons of videos and so forth. These round tables are available. They have it happen every week. You need to go to the website and register. Or you can also Join the premium program, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee. We offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a terrific curriculum, which is a taught in video lectures and case studies, and we've had over 700 successful entrepreneurs participate in building this curriculum. We have a core, which teaches seven core topics that you have to learn. If you're going to build a business, you need to learn 
bootstrapping, you need to learn positioning, customer validation, customer acquisition, team building, market sizing, financing. These are topics you have to learn. You have no choice. If you, these are the building blocks of a successful business, and we have a great curriculum teaching all that, and we've had over 700 successful entrepreneurs help build that curriculum with their journeys, their advice, their lessons from the trenches. It's a video lectures and case study based curriculum. In the premium program, you also have access to additional strategy consulting in our private roundtables, business development help, financing help, and help with media relations and publicity. You can go to the Million Dollar Club and um, you will get some case studies of our success stories. If you go to the quantifying the one-on-one -on -one in value equation, you will see an analysis of the premium member value, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee, will, will get you value worth of $375,000 in cash and 5 to 10% equity worth of value. So we, we have tried to democratize uh, entrepreneurship education and incubation as much as possible and created a pricing structure and a program structure that lets you you know, learn all that you need to learn at a very affordable price point. Um, I also want you to I want to introduce you to something new that we are just, you know, starting to bring into the market is an offer called 1M1M Basic, which allows you to just subscribe to the 1M1M curriculum for $99 a month. Maureen, could you please put the link um, this link that you have on the screen on the public chat as well. So what this allows you to do is if you feel uncomfortable paying a thousand dollar right away, you can still go into the curriculum only 1M1M basic and just spend a month studying curriculum. And if you really have the time, if you can put in 50 hours, let's say during the course of a month, or maybe more, if you can put in 100 hours during the course of a month and intensely study the curriculum, you will also learn a lot. So just by spending $99, you can hugely enhance your knowledge and accelerate your process of how to put one foot before the other. So, so far, we had these free roundtables and we had the $1,000 annual membership fee premium program now we are bringing you another option of just studying the curriculum at a you know, much lower price point. If you need, if you can't finish all, the, all that you want to learn from the curriculum in a month, do it for two months, do it for three months, but it is, you know, it is at a lower price point than the premium program that will also help you learn and accelerate your learning. So you know, in our effort to democratize the process of learning, we are bringing you, you know, more and more affordable options of how you can take advantage of the platform that we have created here. So, you know, the website has tons of information about everything. If you have, I'm particularly interested in having most of your methodology gaps plugged. And that's why we are focusing you on getting the curriculum under your belt. And if you can just do that, you will make huge progress. So um, I see every time we do these roundtables, I see a lot of methodology gaps. Positioning is something most of you are not paying attention to. So please, if you, if you don't understand positioning, go subscribe to the curriculum, do the positioning module, learn the positioning methodology, and, and you, that already will put you ahead by a lot. Um, our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. Even if you decide you want to raise money at some point, you're going to have to bootstrap your way to validation. Investors simply do not fund unvalidated businesses. And the only way you can validate to a point where you can even get some investor interest is by following a bootstrapped, lean, capital-efficient phase where you can get to validation. That's pretty much it. Um, these, uh, you know, we do have tremendous uh, footprint out there in the media and social media. We cover, we, uh, you know, touch a community of over a quarter million people. 
So if you are part of the premium program, you can also use that network and that community to get the word out there about your product or service. You're welcome to do that. That's part of the premium service. That's pretty much it in terms of what I have to say about the program, and you're very welcome to ask questions either in public chat or by dialing in. I will put up the slide in just a moment. One mention of the affiliate program, if you're trying to build a community of entrepreneurs anywhere in the world, you're welcome to partner with us through the affiliate program. We have free roundtables every week. Feel free to register and uh, book your slot to pitch. We generally have you know, these slots booked up in advance quite a bit by two, three weeks in advance these days. If you're still working, uh, today we had somebody who actually read Vision India 2020 and came up with a business idea that kind of is a derivative of one of the Vision India 2020 ideas. But you're welcome to take Vision India 2020 and, and use it as an ideation exercise if you haven't come up with a with an idea yet. The book is available on Amazon and on Kindle. Incubator in a Box is our uh, platform that, through which we work with corporations, governments, and so forth to build incubation programs on their behalf and run it on their behalf in different communities that they want to support. That's pretty much it. We can go to Q&A. These are the call-in instructions. Do you have questions? And also, I would like some feedback from you on 1M1M Basic, the curriculum only offer. Does that help you? Does that, I know all of you are trying to plug your various knowledge gaps and put one foot before the other. Based on what we are bringing you, this new offer, does that help you? Is this something that you want to use? What is your feedback? We'd like to learn from you as well. Please use the public chat to, uh, to interact. And while you're doing that, let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. Her email is irina at 1m1m.com. Any questions about the 1m1m program, any part of the 1m1m program, premium, basic, free, please feel free to contact Irina and she'll be happy to help you understand your options. Anybody, questions, comments, feedback for us? Introductions. No? Nobody has any questions. Surprisingly quiet audience. We've had very interactive audiences for a while. Uh, Swami Ganeshan, you're sending me um, Private messages, I, uh, Bhavisha, you're sending me private messages. I suggest you send to all participants. Swami Ganesha's question is sequencing is a challenge. I'm wondering if the curriculum will guide in the process. Absolutely. Curriculum will definitely guide in the process. You need to set your send to all participants. The chat should be sent to all participants. In any case, Swami, I just answered your question. Feel free to get started with the curriculum and, and you can, if you decide that you want to also use the private roundtables and, and get more interactive guidance, you can always switch to the premium program. But if you want to just start with the curriculum and, and spend a significant amount of time studying the curriculum and, you know, just upgrading your knowledge and methodology, that would also be fine. Go sign up for the basic. Bhavi Shah is asking me if we can chat in private, please. No, we do not have any such provision. You either chat here in public chat or you can join the premium program and, and use the private roundtables and that's about it. There is a private one-on-one -on -one uh, option available, but that's only available to premium members, and that's a $750 an hour private consulting, but that's only available to premium members. Anybody else? Questions, comments, issues that you're grappling with that we can help you address?
No other questions. Swami Ganeshan, your question is if you have a co-founder problem, should you seek one? Um, that really depends on what your skill set is and why you're seeking a co-founder. Um, people do, we are actually of the opinion that you can, you can do fine as a solo founder as well, but if you choose to do a co-founder, I prefer that you work with somebody that you know personally. Um, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to work with people who've met, whom you don't really know as a co-founder because it's a very tight relationship and it's uh, it's almost like a marriage and you don't want to go into a long-term commitment of working with somebody without knowing somebody for a long time. You're saying that you have a tech background and you don't have uh, retail um, expertise. You know, I think you can go work with, try to hire somebody who who has retail background um, to fit to plug that skill gap. That's one way to do it. Um, but you have to be very careful about hiring co-founders. You cannot hire co-founders in a light way. That's a very very long-term decision, and you've got to be very careful about making that decision. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Complementary skill set is always one of the reasons why people seek co-founders. That's and especially if you have major gaps, that's one way to plug that gap, absolutely. So so there is merit to the question you're asking about complementing your gap in retail with somebody from that industry. Any other questions before we wrap up, folks? We're already past the 9.30 a.m. Pacific time cutoff. All right, well, we'll see you next week. Uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, reserve your slot and um, and we'll uh, continue the working session. And uh, those of you who are contemplating joining the program, if you have questions, please reach out to Irina, irina at 1mby1m.com. Basic, premium, whichever suits your needs, feel free to pick one. If you have questions about one versus the other, call Irina and she'll, have, she'll be happy to have work with you. Bye everybody, thank you for coming today.